Well, hello, English 111 students. I hope you all had a great Thanksgiving week. It was a week off. I hope you took it as a week off and enjoyed time with friends and family. But we are back now for week 14 of our 16-week course, which means we are very close to being done. But we are not done yet. So I need you all to stay engaged because we have one more essay and a couple more quizzes to take before this is all over. This week, what we're going to do is today we're going to talk about the art of visual persuasion. I love this lecture. I love the lectures that we're going to do for the remainder of the semester, by the way. Um, you're going to read chapter 14 of your textbook. So read chapter 14, then watch this video, listen to this presentation, which is on the art of visual persuasion. And then by the end of this week, by Sunday, December 6th, you need to have completed Quiz 7, okay, so do Quiz 7, and also choose your topic for Essay 4. In the Week 14 folder, you will see a little quiz, as it were, uh, for you to submit your topic, submit your thesis for Essay number 4. Okay, so that's what we need to do this week. Read Chapter 14, listen to this presentation, take Quiz 7, and choose your topic for essay number four. Now let's talk about essay number four a little bit. This essay is like all the others. It's got to be four to five pages in length. You've got to do it in MLA format. You've got to double space it. Uh, you've got to use Times New Roman or Courier New Font. You have This time you have to have at least four academic sources. So please make sure you've included four academic sources. It's easy to remember. Essay four requires four academic sources. That means journal articles, magazine articles, books, that sort of thing. Limit your number of websites and limit the number of certainly .com, .org type websites. Okay, try to use academic sources. We talked about that during our research section. Uh, earlier in the semester. If you have any questions, though, reach out to me. Call me, email me, text me. We'll talk through it, okay? This essay, now this is the other thing, right? This essay is a proposal essay. You must make an argument of proposal. And we'll talk about pro what a proposal is here in just a minute. We'll review that. We've talked about it, but we'll review it here in just a minute. But like every other essay, you can choose any topic you want, okay? So, Four to five pages, MLA format, double space, Times New Roman or Courier New, at least four academic sources. It must be a proposal essay, an argument of proposal, and you can choose any topic you want as long as you are propose, proposing something. Okay, so let's, let's just review what is an argument of proposal. What is a proposal thesis statement? It identifies a problem or a topic, right? It makes a claim, so you have a topic, you have a claim, and the claim is usually written as A should do B, or A should not do B, right? And then our reasons, or our main points, are our because of C uh, portion of the formula. Now, you, you, if you've watched my other lecture on the argument of proposal, you probably know what I'm talking about already. So here's the example we used during that lecture. Every student who takes out uh, a federal student loan, that's our topic, federal student loans, should have to perform some sort of national service. So there's our proposal. Every student who takes out a federal student loan should have to perform some sort of national service because, and here come my three main points, it will ensure the country gets something in return for the loan, number one. Number two, it will teach personal responsibility. And number three, it will enhance national pride and patriotism. A should do B because of C. If you use that formula, you will have a beautiful, beautiful thesis statement for a proposal essay, okay? But you can make any proposal you want. It doesn't matter. Just make it realistic, okay? <laughs> Don't do something crazy, but do something real. Propose something, change to our society, a change to our laws, a change to education, some kind of social change. This is an argument of proposal. How do you write an argument or proposal? You clearly define the problem to be addressed, right? 
You create a clear thesis statement that identifies the problem, suggests the change or action, and gives the reasons for the change or action. That's what we just talked about in the thesis. We conduct our research. Then we revise our thesis statement based on our research, if need be. We develop our main points, which should be a part of our thesis statement, and then we write the proposal. It's that easy, right? It's that easy. If you get the thesis statement right, it's almost that easy. The thesis statement with your, your clear assertion and your clear main points is half the battle, folks. Remember, I called it the spine of your essay because it holds everything up. If you can get that thesis statement right, you are on the road to an A-plus paper, okay? Some considerations when we're talking about arguments or proposal, and again, this is review. Um, in the main body, you must demonstrate how your change or action addresses the problem at hand. That change or action has to be address the problem at hand. You must also demonstrate that your change of act or, or action is feasible, right? It's got to be realistic. Your change or action must be directed to the future. We don't try to change the past. We only change the future. And you can use visuals if you want to. Now, I will allow you to put visuals in this paper, but you cannot count them towards your page total of four to five pages. So if you want to put a picture at the end in an appendix, that's fine, a graph or anything like that, but you cannot count it towards your page total. You still have to have four to five pages of written material. And then your, uh, your essay is going to look just like this, just like all of our other essays. You're going to have an introduction with a draw, background, and a thesis statement as the last sentence. Then you're going to have three main body paragraphs, each one having a topic sentence as the first sentence, which identifies your main points. And then your evidences based on your research, and then any rebuttals that you need to address. And then your fifth paragraph, your final paragraph, is going to be your conclusion where you restate your thesis statement, you restate your main points, and you give your readers your next steps. What do they do with the information you've just given them? Okay, and that's it, right? That's it. That's how we do a proposal essay. If you have any questions on that, maybe you can stop this recording, go back and review what I've said again, or you can text me, email me, uh, call me. Let's get it right, right? If you have any questions, let me know. Okay, so let's talk about our thesis statement uh, an outline and our papers as we go ahead. These are the deadlines we're going to be working with. So this is for through the remainder of the semester, right? You need to have your thesis, your topic uh, identified. It's due this week. That's what I told you earlier, right? So by Sunday, December 6th, you've got to identify your topic. And again, there's a link in the week 14 folder where you can go and do that. Just to give you a future reference, the rough draft is going to be due one week after that, which is going to be Sunday, December the 13th. That's when your rough drafts are due if you want me to take a look at them. And your final drafts are going to be due Wednesday, December 16th, so only three days later. So I'm going to have to turn those rough drafts around if you turn them in. Again, rough drafts are not required in this class. But if you decide to do it, I'll try to turn it around very, very quickly. So you will have a couple days to finalize your final draft. Okay, so those are the dates we're looking at as we drive to the end of this semester. If you have any questions about those dates, let me know. Okay, let's talk about visual persuasion. And, and when I started lecturing on this several years back, uh, I had a choice. I could sit here and lecture on it, or we could do a practical exercise and just look at some visual uh, images and paintings and pictures and see what, uh, see what we can learn from them. So I've, I chose to do that. I chose to Take the more practical approach, the more hands-on approach. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a series of photos. I want you to, when you look at each photo, pause the recording, take a look at that photo, and maybe answer these, some of these questions. What's the photo depicting, generally? What is it? It's got to answer, <laughs> got to answer that first, right? What are the visual elements of persuasion that you see in this photograph or painting or whatever it is? And what emotions are the photographer trying to conjure? Is, you know, what, what emotions is... Uh, you know, are the is photographer trying to, to conjure in this photograph? Okay, so let's start it. I'll do the first one with you. I'll do them all with you, obviously, but we'll, we'll see how we, we'll see how it goes. Okay. So, before you pause this, let me tell you this is a photo from the Vietnam era. It showed up on Newsweek magazine sometime toward the end of the Vietnam War, so 1974, 75. It was probably is probably one of the most famous uh, photographs from the Vietnam War. 
What do you see going on here? Go ahead and pause, and when you return, we'll talk about it. Okay, so what are we seeing here generally? Again, I told you, it's Vietnam War. We see some kids running away from what looks like uh, probably a napalm, a bomb attack in the, in, the, in the background there. So what are some of the things that we're seeing? What persuades us in this photo? What are we seeing that gets our emotions stirred up and may persuade us, right, encourage us, cause us to make a change, to take action in some way. Uh, so you're obviously not here with me in this room that I'm in right now, so I'm going to have to kind of lead the charge on this. But, uh, but as I'm talking, go ahead and think about the things that, that you're thinking about and how do they align with what I'm saying. Uh, first of all, you know, this photo is very stark, black and white. Um, it's stark in the sense that you have adults versus children, the adult soldiers and the young children, uh, the indigenous children there, Vietnamese children. Um, you have the soldiers who are dressed in dark colors, olive drab, dark green, and the children are dressed in light colors. You have the soldiers who are well equipped. They have their, their rifles, they have their, their gear, their helmets, their military clothing. The children look pretty uh, like they don't have a whole lot. Um, they're not carrying anything. And the one girl, obviously, which makes this a very pointed picture, is is naked. She doesn't have any clothing on because presumably the clothing was maybe burned off of her. I, I don't know. I don't know why the girl has no clothing. Um, but a very stark, isn't it? The soldiers, uh, if you look at their faces, you can't really see their faces, can you? Um, but they don't look like they're very emotional. It looks like it's another day in the office for them. But the children, most of the children have looks of fear on their faces. The soldiers are not, uh, you know, you got so one soldier looking back, one child looking back. But generally, um, nobody really is concerned about the black smoke behind them. And so this is just, this photo conjures up so many emotions, and which is why it was such a persuasive photo. Uh, from the Vietnam era and why it ended up in the AP and why it ended up on Newsweek magazine. Okay, is this a persuasive photograph? You bet it is. Did it cause a lot of people to stop and think about the horrors of war? You bet it did. And therefore, it encouraged a lot of people to end the war, to get out of Vietnam, to stop the bloodshed. And it made it a very, very powerful poem. A poem, <laughs> photo. Okay, all right. Okay, go ahead and pause this. All right, we're back. Um, what do we see here? Well, this is from the Apollo Eleven moon landing. Uh, this was a picture taken by Neil Armstrong, and the picture is of Buzz Aldrin. Um, we know this because uh, Neil Armstrong was the only one with a black and white camera. He had it attached to the front of his suit. So most of the photographs that were taken from the Apollo 11, uh, who were the, uh, virtually all of the photographs that were taken from by the astronauts on the Apollo 11 moon landing were taken by Neil Armstrong. Um, and so we know this is of Buzz Aldrin. Um, what are some of the characteristics of this that make it emotional, that make it persuasive? Well, First of all, again, starkness. You've got the drab, dark gray, black background, and then you've got the white astronaut. So this idea of contrast of dark and light. Um, you've got um, a very stark, lifeless background. The moon is dead, right? And a very sentient life form in the form of the astronaut right there. So there's a contrast there. Um You've got the astronaut, if you notice on his left arm, so on your right-hand side, is the American flag. The astronaut's arm is turned in such a way that we can see that American flag pretty clearly. And what does that say? It says, hey, Americans, we were the first to land on the moon, right? This life form that's standing on this lifeless planet, our moon, um, is an American, is a United States of America astronaut. The red, white, and blue of the suit stands out, of course, in the red, white, and blue of the flag. Um, just so many things 
make this a memorable photograph. In the visor, you can see the reflection of Neil Armstrong. Actually, you can see the reflection of the astronaut taking the picture. You can see the astronaut of the lunar, uh, excuse me, the reflection of the lunar excursion module, the uh, the LEM, L-E-M. Um, so this is a beautiful photo. Brings out a lot of emotions, a lot of pride for Americans, and therefore was a very famous photo during the and after the Apollo. Uh, moon landing. So I, I don't know what magazines this ended up in, but this this photo is very popular. I've seen it a lot over the years. Um, very powerful because of some of the elements that we just talked about. Okay, look at this photo and answer the three questions that we talked about before. And uh, hit play again when you're ready. Okay, what is this? Well, I don't know what game this is. I'm sure maybe somebody... Somebody, one of you knows, but I don't know what game it is. But I do know this. That is Babe Ruth, the famous Babe Ruth, because he, he's wearing the Yankee pinstripes and the number three. And what's so captivating about this uh, photo is, is I do know this. It's at the end of his career. I don't know if this is the last game he played or what it is, but he is older here. And some of the things that we see that bring that and drive that home are the fact that he's, look how he's leaning on his bat. It's almost like he's using it as a cane. The other things that I see here are, look, at you can see the opposing team along the first baseline there, but and they're all together shoulder to shoulder, but you see Babe Ruth is standing alone. Isn't that crazy? Standing alone, almost like he's a giant, right? And we see his giantness, as it were, because the photographer is taking this picture from a low angle. In other words, the photographer is probably on his knee like the other photographers on the first baseline. See how they're on their knees? This photographer's on his knee shooting up at an up angle at Babe Ruth, which makes him look even bigger. So you've got this idea of of this larger-than-life figure. The stands are full of fans. Uh, They're all here to presumably to see the great king of baseball, Babe Ruth, the great and awesome uh, titan of SWAT. However, isn't it interesting that we don't see his face. And I always ask my students, why don't we see his face? Why didn't the photographers that were taking the picture on the first baseline, they're obviously shooting at Babe Ruth, why didn't those pictures not make it into history? Because this is a very famous baseball history photograph. Why this one? And the answer that I always come to, no matter how many times I look at this picture, is that if we saw his face, we'd see the old wrinkled Babe Ruth. But when we look at him from behind, we see the pinstripes And the number three, the giant of a man. We don't see the old man. We see the icon. Isn't that amazing? And so for all of those reasons, this photograph is iconic and beautiful and stirs the emotion. As a baseball fan myself, I love this photo. I'd like to say that I have it framed and hanging on my wall, but I do not. (laughs) I would love to have it framed and hanging on my wall. Um, It's a beautiful, beautiful photo. And it has so many elements that make it persuasive. Everybody knows this one, right? So let's pause, think about the three questions, and come back when you're ready. Okay, this is the great Mona Lisa, painted by Leonardo da Vinci. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this one, but some of the things that have captivated historians over the years, the use of color, right? There's a lot of color, color contrast. When this was first painted, the colors would have been more vibrant. Um, but nonetheless, there is a lot of color contrast. Um, this is a, uh, no matter what your um, opinion of the beauty of Mona Lisa is, in her day that she was considered, would have been considered the height of a beautiful woman. And so you have a beautiful woman here, uh, Beautiful color contrasts. Um, you've got a neat and interesting background, right? Uh, looks like kind of a lake and then a, uh, like a, a roadway there off her right shoulder. Uh, kind of a stark landscape up to the river or lake, whatever that is. So an interesting and intriguing background. Don't know much about that. But here's the big question about Mona Lisa. Is she smiling? <laughs> right? Isn't that the big question? Because if you look at it, it looks like she's smiling, or is she? And so a lot of historians have asked that question. Also, one of the intriguing things about Mona Lisa, and you can actually do this if you want to, move around. 
move down low, move up high, move to the right, move to the left. It always looks like she's looking at you, no matter where you are in the room. Lots of intriguing things about this picture, which make it persuasive and can, it just make it interesting. And, 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 and do you see how the painter, Da Vinci, used elements of color, style, uh, science, um, and just this intrigue of is she smiling or is she not? Is she looking at me or is she not looking at me? All of these things come to bear in the Mona Lisa and make it a persuasive piece of art. Another piece of art. What is this one? Vincent van Gogh's Starry Night. Okay. Thinking about those three questions. Again, uh, his use of swirls. Like he uses swirls, doesn't he, a lot. And he uses short brush strokes. This was one of Van Gogh's signatures. He uses these short brush strokes. If you get up close to Starry Night, and I've seen this in person uh, when I was in, uh, in Amsterdam. When you get up close, uh, the brush strokes are really short, and he uses a lot of swirls. This is supposed to be a night scene. The swirls make the night come alive. This is not a, a, a still night. This night has wind. This night has kinetic energy. This night has motion. And so he wants us to see that. It's, this night is clear as well. We can see the stars and the moon and the sky. This night was also in motion because we look at the mountains in the, in the background, those blue mountains in the background. Don't they look like waves on the ocean? So he's given us this idea of motion. Things are happening in this night world, wherever this is. Van Gogh was painting in France. So this is probably a town in southern France where he painted uh, and lived a lot of his life. But look at the town. What do you see going on there? I want to draw your attention to the church in the middle of the town. The church is the highest point, isn't it? The steeple stands up much, much higher than any other building or structure in that town. And yet look at the lights. There's no light. There are no lights on in the church. But look around the town. In the houses around the church, there are lights on in a lot of the houses. And so the idea I think Van Gogh was going for here, because you got to remember, we're in a transition period during his lifetime in Europe where the church, which had once been the center of French society, of European society, of each town in Europe, is now starting to wane. Its influence is starting to wane. Its importance in the social structures of, Euro of, of European government and European society are starting to decline. And so I think Van Gogh was making a very pointed point in this painting. The night's alive. The sky is moving. The mountains are moving like waves on the ocean. The stars are out. Energy is coming down from the sky. The lights are on in the homes of this little town. This, is, this night is alive. There are things going on. There is energy except in the church. The church is dead. And folks, I believe that that was Van Gogh's point, one of his points in Starry Night. It was a commentary on the church and its influence in then modern Europe. And we see that has played out certainly to today, where the church is virtually non-influential in European society, certainly in French society. And I'm not saying there's not, not a church there. And I'm not saying the church doesn't have influence in certain pockets of European society and certain individuals' lives. But on, on the whole, the church has largely died off in Europe. And I think Van Gogh was seeing that during his lifetime. And this is his, one, this is, uh, his commentary on that. Persuasive? You bet it is. What makes these images appealing, the images that we've just looked at? In many cases, the color, the contrast, the perspectives, in the case of the uh, Babe Ruth photo, the starkness and the candor of the photos, in the case of the Vietnam photo, the simplicity of things, the significance of things, like in the Van Gogh painting, the emotions attached to it, again, the Vietnam photo, the logical appeal and the credibility of that we see. The, the, the Vietnam era photo is very credible, isn't it? Because we see the starkness, the reality of war. Folks, visual persuasion is so very important. We are persuaded 
by visual elements every day of our lives. When you see a billboard, a magazine ad, something on the internet, the people, the marketeers that have created, excuse me, have created these things, have done it to try to persuade you. We need to be able to break down elements of what we see to try to get at the heart of what the marketeer, the, the painter, the, the, the photographer are trying to persuade us. What are they trying, what are they using to try to persuade us? Because we want to be critical thinkers. We don't want to just be led along like a hog or a, a cow with a, a ring in its nose. We don't want to just be led from place to place. We don't want to unconsciously be doing things based on the visual persuasion that's levied against us. We want to make logical decisions, critical decisions. And so to do that, we need to be able to look at visual art, whether it's art or photography or whatever it is, marketing uh, uh, schemes, uh, marketing graphics. We need to be able to look at these things and break them down and say, what is this person who created this trying to get me to do? And if we decide they're trying to get us to do something that we want to do, then we do it, right? <laughs> but maybe they're going to try to get us to do something we don't want to do, or we know that we shouldn't do. And that's where our critical thought and decision-making jumps in, and that's where we make the right decision based on the information that we've gleaned through critical thinking. Visual persuasion is all around us. We've got to know how to deal with it. Marshall McL McLuhan, this is taken from your book, said this, he said this, we shape our tools, and afterwards... Our tools shape us. All media works us over completely. We can create things, right? As we create things, those things shape us, don't they? As we engage with visual media, that media, as we engage with it, that media then in turn shapes us. As we approach it, it approaches us and works us over completely. The difference between the critical thinker and the uncritical thinker is that the uncritical thinker just gets, just gets worked over and responds instinctively to whatever. The critical thinker, on the other hand, media may try to work them over, but they analyze, filter media in such a way that they then work the media over. <laughs> right? They take control of the working over process and make good decisions based on their critical analysis of the visual art, photography, or whatever, graphic, whatever it is. Be a critical thinker when it comes to visual media. Because if you're not, you could be persuaded to do things that you don't want to do. And I know none of you want to do that. You want to be critical thinkers. You want to work the media over, not have it work you over. All right. All right. So that's our lecture for today, about, about 30 minutes. Again, I want to reiterate what you need to do this week is read chapter 14, listen to this presentation, which you've just done, uh, complete quiz number seven, and choose your topic by clicking on the link in the week 14 folder. Okay. You got to do all these things, get them done. And, uh, Keep driving on this semester. We don't want to back off now. I'm almost done grading essay number three. I'm so close I can taste it. I should be done by no later than Tuesday of this week. Hang in there. Uh, your, pap your paper is most likely already graded. If it's not, I'm getting to it. I, I promise I'm going to get it graded. All right. Have a great week. If you need anything, let me know. See you later. <laughs>